So hi everybody, welcome to our talk, A Tale of Two Graph Frameworks on Spark, Graph Frames, and Tinkerpop OLAP. I'm Russell Spitzer and this is Artem Ali. Uh, if you don't know Artem, he is a graph analytics expert. Uh, he lives on the planet Earth, but not on the same side that I do. I am a distributed systems uh, enthusiast. We both work at Datastax, uh, mostly on the integration of Cassandra with a bunch of other t big data technologies. In particular, we both work a lot with Spark, so uh, today we want to tell you about something new that we've both kind of been working on, which is both Apache Tinkerpop and uh, Graph Frames. Now these are two libraries and frameworks that you can use with your graph data or with other data, and, using, uh, and you can use graph algorithms on them. They both share an underlying component, is that they can both use Spark as an execution engine, but they both take different trade-offs and have different options basically as they're running, which shape uh, which of these you should choose for your particular application. So just to start off with, anyone who hasn't seen uh, graphs before, graphs are just a group of things we call vertices and edges. Usually vertices rely, uh, refer to some kind of object, so like for example, they could be these spaceships. And edges uh, refer to, or, and these, <laughs> sorry, these spaceships, and they have properties, you know, various things that are, are attributes of them. And then we can also uh, have these relationships between them, which we usually call edges. So here we've got a bunch of edges connecting these spaceships, which tell you that the first USS Enterprise was succeeded by the second USS Enterprise, and then another Enterprise and another one, and they all have their own call, call signs, and it's great. Uh, a cool thing to note is that these edges can also have their own properties and their own identifying information. And that means we can get this kind of network of the relationship between all of these different things. Now, our vertices and our edges don't actually have to all be of one particular type. This is one of the cool aspects of a graph, is that we can actually mix things like ships in our graph with things like crew members. So since we can have both of these things in the same graph, we can have edges that then relate our crew members to our ship types. And with all of these relationships, we actually get a pretty complete description of the interactions between crew members, ships, and other crew members. So why is this really exciting? Uh, obviously, this looks like a lot of lines. We have a lot of labels. There's a lot of mixing of things together. But the reason that this is really great is that the questions we can ask of a graph are a little bit different than the questions we can ask of relational data. So for example, asking the question, what captain served after Kirk, or what ship was two after the first Starship Enterprise, is a lot easier to ask of graph data than it is to ask of relational data. In relational world, we would probably have to do a lot of joins among our normalized forms of our various types of data to actually get our end result. But graphs usually let us express these requests as something that's a little bit simpler. So for example, with our current little graph right here, we may want to ask the question, what was the captain after Kirk? Well, to do that, we actually can follow these well-documented edges and say, well, we'll start at the Kirk vertex, and then we'll move to the ship that he served on, see what ship followed that, and then go to the crew of that ship. So rather than describing this in a term of joins and, and matching up IDs, we just naturally follow the edges of the graph to uh, answer our question. If we want to do a similar question, like which was two ships after the first enterprise, we just follow the seceded by edge twice. So instead of saying we have to join and match ID and then join and match ID, we just follow this edge two times. So <coughs> this is kind of uh, an overview of Tinkerpop. So Tinkerpop is one of the many ways you can actually use to access and express these kind of traversals through a graph. It's made up of a lot of different components. It's all open source. Uh, and one of these components is the Gremlin Traversal Language. Now, the Gremlin Traversal Language is a language for actually expressing that go from one vertice, follow its edges, go to another vertice, and do the, all these kind of exciting things. It also has, uh, you'll notice, a little purple guy down in the corner there. And it represents the fact that the underlying execution engine is independent of the language. We can actually use this language to do both really fast OLTP queries, or we can actually execute our traversals using something like Spark and do a more analytics processing. But let's start off by talking a, a little bit about how to do some of these OLTP queries. 
And for that, we're going to do a quick switcheroo, which requires two mic swaps. Okay. So we will go to the another universe. It will be. I will use Mo movie lens example that use a set of have a set of movies and movies are rated by users and users uh, have its own occupation and movies has a, a set of genre. And here is an example of such kind of chart, uh, uh, such kind of graph. So for example, we have this Star Trek movies that has a sci-fi, that is sci-fi, or we have Terminator movies that is a total sci-fi, and we have users who rate them, and we have occupation of that users, like artist, programmer, lawyer, college grad, grand students. So let's go for the, for the examples. In this case, I will use our data stacks studio, and we'll start with a uh, OLTP vertex centric vertices uh, queries. So that this is a query I used to get this random subgraph. I will talk about them la it later. So let's start from the. So well, as Russell said, we need to ask question to our to our query, uh, to our graph. For example, what Star Trek movies did a user rate? So in this case, we'll. OLTP will start from one user saying graph, get vertices, find vertices user that have ID 710. And then we will traverse to other vertices. Uh, in this case, we will find uh, what uh, followed by the rated edges to the movie vertices with the out. Then we will filter out our Star Trek movies. And we will get the set of movies that user was was watching. So, well, actually, uh, let's see how how the traversal will lo lo look. I will get pass and unfold it just to show you some kind of visualization. It, uh, the traversal was very simple. We start from the users, follow up the rated vertices, and go to the to the movies. Well, it's really simple. One step. Uh, traversal. We can do it a little bit more complicated. So let's see what genre of this what the genre of this movie is. In this case, we add one more out traversal with a genre uh, ages, and we get a little bit much, uh, a little bit messy uh, picture. But still, we start from the user, go to the movie, and then go to the genre. In this case, it's a sci-fi, action, and adventure. But um, let's ask a more useful question. For example, what, is a, what was the rating of that Star Trek movies? And we will, in this case, we will do the much longer traversal. We will start from the user, go to the movies. And in this case, I will save the movies, uh, the rating of H as an R. Then I will go to the movies. Then I will find movies that have a Star Trek. And then I will select movies and the rating with a, with a select keyword. And I will get the table, and it, that will show that user like uh, that will show all the <coughs> all the ratings. So, for example, user like Star Trek six but hates Star Trek five. Why not? So, in this place, I will switch back to the Russell. Uh, we will do all these fancy things. Thanks. <coughs> Everyone should just bask in that image while I get ready. So um, this was a good example. We had these little queries. We started at one vertex. We moved out. We got a little bit of data. And then we stopped. But what happens when we have a lot of data? What if we want to ask a question that relates to all of our data at once? Well, then we start having to look past basic systems that start with just one vertex, and we have to think about processing everything at once. So for that, we uh, like to look at Spark. Spark has a pretty basic execution model. I'm just going to go over a quick overview of the things you need to worry about. Um, we start out with a driver, which is like your application. It's got a bunch of executors that run independent pieces of work. The important thing to know about all of this 
is that they're each working on independent pieces of your data that are all separate. And every once in a while, whenever you want any piece of your data to relate to any other piece of your data, you have to do a shuffle. And shuffles are expensive, and we generally want to avoid them. You've probably heard this a few times so far at this conference. There's a serialization penalty, lots of stuff in there. So shuffles uh, over the network require disk I.O. Expensive, bad. We usually don't want to do them unless we have to. So given that knowledge and that little basic understanding of Spark, how does Tinkerpop OLAP work? So the Tinkerpop Spark OLAP engine works by starting a traversal at every single vertice at once and then moving from all of those vertices to all of the next vertices in a shuffle step. And we've got a quick little diagram of how that works. But before we can even do that, we have to describe that di distributing our data like this requires some kind of partitioning. We need some way of taking all of our data and splitting it up amongst all these machines. And the way we end up doing that in Tinkerpop is we build a pair RDD, where one side is the ID for the vertex, and then the other side of the pair is going to be all of the information about that vertice and its outgoing edges. So this means we end up with this basic adjacency list representation, where everything we would need to know about a vertex, all of its properties, and all the properties of its edges are directly accessible without doing a shuffle. But if we want to go from one vertex to another vertex, we have to do those shuffles, because we have to match up the edge property, which will have a, another vertex ID on it, uh, to the ID column of our pair RDD. So basically, the way that's going to look is that we end up with this partition data that's sitting like this. We start our traverser on every single vertex. And then whenever we want to, for example, move from one vertex to another, we perform a shuffle step and move our, our, our traversers to the new vertexes that they are going to land on, the new vertices that they're landing on. Now, we'll probably end up doing this over and over again. A lot of graph algorithms basically have this pattern of starting on one vertex and then moving to another. And you do that several times before you eventually terminate and return as a result. So we'll repeat that with a shuffle every single time we go through. And eventually, we, uh, our traversers halt, or the program that we've put into our traversers indicates that they are ready to halt. And we return a result back to the user. So the cool thing about all of this architecture is that you don't actually have to know any of this is happening when you actually write your traversal. You use the same Gremlin traversal language, but the execution engine will just be this under the hood rather than doing a in-memory lookup. That's what happens in the uh, OLTP examples. So let's just show a quick few examples of how that works. Yeah, so. So back to our example and to our movie universe. And now we will do all up queries. First of all, I will just cache the graph to run all the query faster. And we'll ask another set of questions. So now, now I will ask a kind of all up questions about averages and about counts. So the first question is how many movies in the data set for each genre? And this is a well, pretty simple one-step query. We just get the, all the movies, all vertices that have label movie, and do our, our genre, and then group count by name. And we see that most of the, our movies are drama, and not, not much sci-fi here. But uh, let's check who is uh, watching sci-fi. And in this case, it will be a really long traversal because we will start from the we will start from the genre sci-fi, and we will go to the to the occupation of the user. So we will start genre, go opposite direction to the by the genre age. So we will go to the movie, then we will go to the users, then we will go to the occupation, and group count by name, and we will see that there are a lot of most of our users are students, and they rate most of the, of the sky fi films. And well, programmers are only on the say, first pla fifth place. So but what, the, what genre are programmers watching, we will ask. 
And in this case, we will go in opposite direction, but still, it will be the same kind of traversal. We'll start from the programmer, go, go by the occupation to the go to the uh, to the movie by rated, go to the genre, and we'll group by by name. And we will see that, well, actually, uh, programmers see a lot of, watching a lot of sci-fi, much more than other guys. So, but what, let's ask more useful questions. But what is the average Star Trek rating? And that's another traditional all-up question. And in this case, I will use a project, uh, project, project, uh, case, uh, case uh, function. But we'll start from the Star Trek movies, project names and ratings. So nating, uh, name will be get it as a value of the, of the movie properties. And rating will be get it from the in age star. And we'll do mean on it. So we will see that, well, no one likes Star Trek V, you can see. And it gets also rating. So and this. I will switch. So that was example of all up kind of query that used that bunch of. <laughs> so uh, obviously doing this kind of traversal uh, using Tinkerpop is going to have a bunch of pros and a bunch of cons. So the main pros here is that every time we're doing a message pass using Tinkerpop, we only have to do a single shuffle. Because we have that pair RDD representation, we already know the identity of every vertex that we're sending a message to. So we don't actually have to look that up from somewhere else. The edges and the edge properties are also all directly accessible without actually doing a step. So if I need to look up something that's a value of my edge, I don't actually have to shuffle to get that value. It's very flexible because the language itself allows for a lot of different things to be composed and put together. And basically, arbitrary code can be written into this, uh, this library or into this language and then run. Uh, and of course, it can use basically any Java type. Anything inside can be inside of a vertex. And you can do all kinds of exciting things there. But the important cons to know here is that because our pair RDD is this adjacency list, we're going to have a problem with extremely high degree verte vertexes. Because if we have an extremely high degree, that means that the Spark partition needs to necessarily hold all the information for every single edge that's associated with a uh, vertex. So a high degree vertex is going to basically OOM our executor. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the flexibility of the framework, while it makes it really possible for us to put all sorts of cool objects inside of our graph, makes it a little bit harder for the graph engine itself to actually optimize the request we're doing. We've seen a lot of talks about how Catalyst works and a lot of uh, talking about you know, doing these low-level optimizations. And you can't really do that when you have generic types inside of your vertices. So, that's some of the cons that come with Tinkerpop, but there is another option that has a different set of pros and a different set of cons, and that is GraphFrames. GraphFrames is offered as a third-party package. It's another uh, project out of the AMP lab at Berkeley. And one of the greatest things about this is that it actually integrates directly in with the data set, data frame world in the rest of Spark. So while Tinkerpop is kind of its own completely self-sustained, self-contained collection of APIs and server programs, graph frames can be integrated with your data frame application that's written right now. So just to do a quick example of uh, how this is set up, Graph frames are built on a basic relational model. Unlike Tinkerpop, which can have an underlying graph model, the graph frame is built on two relational tables uh, or data frames. So those two data frames have only a few requirements. The vertex data frame, as we see over there, has to have an ID column. And then every other column is basically treated as a property. And the edges data frame where we have a source and destination column. And those columns have to directly indicate IDs in our vertex data frame. So in this little example, I have a tiny graph here where we have Jordy and Data, and they're linked together by a single edge, which has a property of friend. So one thing that you can notice here that's going to be different than in Tinkerpop is that we're only allowed to have Spark SQL types here. Really, only Catalyst-supported types can go in any of these columns. We can't just put arbitrary objects in there because Catalyst can't optimize that sort of thing. So 
You have to have Spark SQL types. And the other thing is that there is no built-in concept of a label here. So if our vertex data frame has different types of vertices in it, then we actually have to manually add a column ourselves to indicate that, for example, that Jordy is a crew member and not a spaceship, if we're going to have them in the same graph. So one of the cool things, though, uh, that we get with all of this is that everything that we do in our data frames is going to kind of be going through the Catalyst engine, which means we get all of that great uh, bytecode level optimizations. We get all of the great reshuffling and reorganizing of our plan that's going to optimize it to hopefully give us better performance. Although some of the methods inside of the GraphFrames library do still fall back to GraphX methods, which are all RDD based. But usually in these cases, it's because there's a more efficient way to do this without a message pass and other things like that. Uh, so let's take a quick look at a basic uh, graph frame algorithm, a basic graph frame uh, a motif match. So graph frames has a motif matching, uh, which is the basis of a lot of its algorithms. And it looks a little like this uh, syntax up in the corner, where we have uh, A in a curly braces, and then an edge, E, inside of square braces, connecting to a, another vertex, B, which again is in curly braces. So when you pass this kind of string into graph frames and you ask it to find these triplets of A, E, B, what it's going to actually do is build up a series of joins. So it starts by taking our vertex data frame and labeling every row that comes out of it as A, because obviously we need our source uh, vertices to be labeled. Then we join our A vertices on our edge data frame where the source of the edge matches the identity of A. So this is going to be our first join. Now we have A and we have E, but we don't have B. We don't have the endpoint of this edge. To get that, we have to join the endpoint of the edges in E with the vertices again. And then we get B. So now we've done two different joins. And we've successfully completed a single step from one vertex to another. And you might be saying, that's two joins. And before you showed me an example where we only had to do one join, this is obviously not as good because joins are bad and shuffles are bad, and we don't ever want to shuffle. So why would I ever want to do this over Tinkerpop? Well, there's a couple reasons that you might. So let's take a quick look at this query plan and look at it from the point of view of Catalyst. So Catalyst is going to take a look at this, and it's going to say, oh, this query plan is completely malleable. We're not going to execute it right away. So let's say you ask to, I don't know, only look at one column out of this. If you decide to only look at column A, that, that predicate is going to actually get pushed up through this tree. And every single place that it applies, it can actually get pushed down to the source. So you didn't actually have to explain to Catalyst that, oh, don't worry, selecting A means I only need the A column out or the ID column out of the vertex table. It's going to automatically do that for you. And if possible, push it down to the underlying source where it read this data from. So you get all of that for free without actually having to plan on it. The other cool thing is that all of your joins, all of the normal optimizations that happen when you run through Catalyst are going to keep happening. So it can check whether or not, based on filters or based on pruning, that the size of these other joins could be better served by doing, for example, a broadcast join instead of doing a full shuffle join. So it can start making all of these optimizations in a way that you couldn't automatically do when you're running through Tinkerpop. And of course, the special magic of Catalyst also happens where once this entire plan is put together, once all of these predicates have been moved around and our joins have been chosen for their execution types, we're going to do that same code gen that's going to happen with all other Catalyst operations. And we're not actually going to work on our Java serialized objects as we go through this. So we end up with a much more optimized version of what we would do uh, versus using plain old Java objects the whole time. So this is all pretty cool. And Artem is going to show us a few examples of how to actually use graph frames. Yep. And we will use absolutely the same data and the same universe, but from uh, another notebook. It will be Zeppelin in this case. And well, actually, I use a data stacks database here, so I can Query the same data with uh, graph frames and with a uh, Tinkerpop, and in this case, I will use 
our implementation of graph frame, that is com data stacks, blah, blah, blah. And so it's really easy to load it, just saying I need graph movie links. And I cache it for the performance. So and as Russell said, a graph frame is just a two data frames. It's a vertices and ages data frames, and I can count them. So in this case, I have one million ages here. And I can show the, I can show all these ages and vertices, and you will see that in this case, I have to define ID. We add label here because we are compatible with the Tinkerpop, and so we can see users here, for example. And we have all other columns in, a, in here. And the same for the ages. We have to define SRC, DST, and label columns just to have the different columns. And we will ask the same question to, the, to our graph, but using motive finding. In this case, we will ask, uh, what I'm asking here? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so it will be a question. Uh, yes, what programmers are watching? What? What, progr <laughs> what programmers are watching? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's it's uh, the, the language is not uh, so good as a Syncopop one. So in this case, we will have all this motif. We will say users, occupation age, occupation, uh, users rated to movie, movie gender to genre. And we'll filter out based on labels, so that occupation age is its age with has label, uh, label occupation, and rated age is a label rated, and genre label is a label rated. And then we'll do group by count as we do it in a, for data frames. <laughs> and so you see that it's a little bit longer and I cannot read it. But the result is the same. <coughs> and well, actually, uh, if you take a look at the joints, uh, that <laughs> that query will generate that kind of join. Oh, not that one, because that one is uh, written for the correct SQL database that have uh, different tables for different objects. So for the, in, in our case, l let me show you the real one. So I will just create two tables. One is for vertices and one for ages. And I will have just two tables for them. And I will, the join will look like something like that. I will join join ages, join vertices, and we can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we have a six join for this simple query. And well, it's provide absolutely the same result. So it's grouped by batch answer name and count. By the way, graph frames are much better, are much more readable than the, this kind of join. <coughs> but the, the, the most important thing for the graph frame, it's really a part of the Spark ecosystem. So I can really simple join this data with any other data frames I have in a, in a Spark ecosystem, with MySQL, Cassandra, CSV, any other. So let's imagine we have uh, additional data that says that our user 710 is a RAS. And we have user ID and username here. So I can just join this data with our vertices, create new graph frame with our new vertices, and ask how much movie was uh, rated by Russell. Um, and we will find out that he, he was watching more than 800 movies. The same thing is. Export and import is also very simple because it's just two tables. So to save our graph to in this to the disk, we just need to get vertices and write them, and get, the get edges and write them, and we can then export them, import them back. For example, we can use S Spark SQL just to select ID vertices with ID and edges with SRC and DST columns. So, and well, actually there are a lot of uh, graph algorithms available in the graph frame because all of them are gathered from the graphics and uses, usage of these algorithms are really simple, just in one line. And most interesting thing that there is in a data stacks, we 
mix both languages and get best thing from the Tinkerpop and best thing from the graph frames. And in this case, in data frame, you can mix all these two languages. You can use the traversal language from Tinkerpop, get a data frame, and then use a data frame method to save data or to, in this case, group by, group by name and count. And you will get absolutely the same results. Let me steal this back. Yeah. So. so we just talked a little bit about graph frames. And let's talk now about our performance pro cons here. So again, we're going to be much faster on basic counts, things like that, because our counting engine is going to be our optimized bytecode versions rather than Java serialized objects having to actually access members and fields whenever we filter and things like that. We've got this powerful optimization framework and code gen, and it's really simple to add to other sources. So you know, when we've been talking about composability a lot today, this is a key to being able to take graph algorithms and put them into the middle of a pipeline that's doing a lot of other things. Doing ML work that comes out with a model that applies to a data frame and then want to use that in a graph, it's very easy to do when you're using the graph frames library. Some of the cons are it's not as fast on more complex traversals. Because the way it's storing the edges and the vertices in different data frames means that we have to do two joins every single time we want to do a single step from one vertex to another. And the relational model, of course, is not as flexible. You probably saw when Artem loaded that data, he had to actually include empty null fields for all of the things that weren't a part of the particular vertex if, it didn't match the, uh, if that vertex didn't have those fields. So it's got a bit of a different performance thing. So when you're choosing between these two, you really need to take into account what exactly are you planning to do uh, with graph data. So if you're using a more complicated query, a traversal that requires a lot of different hops or a lot of extensions, then it probably makes sense to choose Tinkerpop, because Tinkerpop's going to have this more efficient method of actually propagating through the graph to a greater depth. But it's not going to be as fast if you're doing a lot of simple counts or aggregations. And of course, because of its storage method, a very high degree vertice is going to lead to executor out of memory exceptions. So this is something that's being worked on right now. But currently, there is no real solution if you have a vertex that perhaps dominates your graph. So for example, we've seen graphs where perhaps location is one of the vertex types. And one of the locations is perhaps China. And you have a lot of users that happen to live in China. So you end up with a single vertex that has hundreds of millions of edges. And obviously, that's going to blow up your graph when it starts trying to shuffle it. On the other hand, graph frames is going to be able to uh, have a different storage method. So it'll be able to fix for a lot of that stuff. It's got a lot of great uh, use cases if you're doing average stats or aggregations and things like that. Connecting to other sources becomes really, really easy. Uh, and of course, uh, these short paths are going to be really easy to, to do because it's going to be able to optimize away some joins in case it's a tiny jump. So whichever you choose, we would be remiss if we didn't say check out Datastax Enterprise because it allows you to use both of these at the same time on a shared uh, library of data. We write it, so we're very proud of the things that we do. Um, and that's about it. So thanks for listening to us. If you want to learn more about graphs, we've got a link here to the free Datastax Academy courses. And uh, you can try the stuff we work on in Datastax Enterprise. And of course, there's some links to Apache Tinkerpop and GraphFrames if you're more interested in just those libraries all by himself. And uh, that's it for us. So if anyone has any questions, we would be glad to field any. So our question is that um, everything we want to retrieve over text, other than with ID, we have to create an index. However, even with index cardinality of one, it will not guarantee that it's only one. So there's no uniqueness of a node, other than their primary ID. So the suggested method oftentimes online is that to run the OLAP query to prune graph. Now, what kind of uh, method do we run on graph frame? Uh, GraphX, GRAPH, or what? 
in that case. Well, if you need to prune it, it's probably a graph frame is most because the graph frame is most addition to the data uh, by data stacks to the especially for the bulk update and bulk delete. So it should be graph frames. Yeah, this is one of Ar Artem didn't say this is something he wrote. He wrote some additional bulk update methods into the graph frames library. So if you are using DataStax Enterprise, you can bulk change your data from a graph frame. Hi, uh, so it sounds like to use this, I just take people on my plain old data, figure out what the text on your vertices and edges are, pay that intellectual cost, and then probably do the multiple times depending on what answers I want. And multiple views. I just want to know if there's any work that sort of quantifies what my savings are going to be as that happens. So I don't think uh, anyone's done some good math on this yet. In general, you want to remember that under the hood, we're really still just doing a lot of joins. So general things that you want to do is with any joins is you want to try to make sure that you're not doing a bunch of gigantic joins. Try to keep one side low cardinality if you can get that into a broadcast instead of, you know, otherwise. I don't, I don't know. Do you have other? Well, I still. Uh, there you go. Uh, well, I, I still think that if you have uh, real a lot of different objects, so you have this uh, object entity model for your SQL data, and if you need to traverse them, your so you'll better to use Tinkerpop, and that traversal will be much shorter. Your two-page SQL that you run for that kind of traversal, and in this case, it will be probably even faster than uh, than your SQL database because it will use uh, all the Spark things. How do you feel about about which what should be late, what should be vertices and what should be edges? Well, actually, it's really simple. If you have entity relationship, entity is uh, entity is a vertices and the relationship is a edges. It's okay. a, it's a, and it's really a, well, I don't know, natural to do that kind of method. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, well, thanks so much for coming out. And uh, feel free to talk to any of us later about any of this stuff. Or Cassandra, I guess, because we spent a lot of time on that, too. <laughs> yeah. okay.